So I have the standard introductory uh, slide here talking about Amazon, and you're like, why is Amazon, what is Amazon doing in gaming, really? And it's a lot. We have a lot of different services that we're pulling together, and we're just calling it Amazon Game Tech. And bringing solutions from across Amazon together for every stage in your game development, including mobile, which is what I'm focused on today. Doo -doo -doo. You, yes, game tech, cool stuff, Twitch, right? So we have global infrastructure and services for your serv uh, kind of your back end infrastructure stuff to help you uh, scale your servers up as well, which is kind of our pre built game services. So we like GameLift and GameSparks, things you could just plug into your game. We also have content creation tool, which is Lumberyard, our AAA game engine. And then distribution and marketing through Amazon's App Store and also through Amazon.com. So that's all cool, but today, let's talk a little bit about mobile graphics performance. So my name is Chris Corliss. I'm one, I am the lead renderer engineer for our mobile team. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the cool things we did this year to get mobile up and running. And by cool things, I say, hey, there's a technical demo. So here on our phone, I'm running an S9. It is plugged into the monitor next to us, or next to me, I should say. And so I'm gonna launch our Bistro Sing. And as I do that, I'm gonna try to bring it up here. Uh, da -da -da, give me a second show you here it is also inside of the editor uh, I hope no do 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 gotta change something here please uh, I thought I would have it in that's me I apologize for this delay I had it all set up and then I forgot to make sure I had it set up properly for you guys. Um, but anyways, so here on the screen, you're seeing the actual bistro demonstration level. We have a kiosk on the other side. We are pushing about one and a half to two million polygons per frame, and it is running 30 frames per second on the S9. We have temporal anti-aliasing. It is a complex geometricing, so that's why you have TAA. Um, and if you compare it to our last year's bistro demo, that is this. It, the quality is about the same, right? We did optimize the scene for mobile a little bit to get it to work, but we did a lot of back-end rendering work as well, and that's why I want to talk about today. Uh, da -da -da. So, uh, my uh, PowerPoint skills have failed me. So, let's take this off. I uh, borrowed this phone from our kiosk, so I need to make sure I return it. About that later. So, you may be asking, how in the world did you guys actually get such a complex scene running on mobile devices? So here's some of the back-end work we did. We call it GMEM, or G GPU memory. So mobile devices have dedicated memory sitting on the GPU that we can access. Now, the amount of data we have for that memory to change this, we can either have 256-bit mode or 128-bit mode. And depending on what, how much data we have, we'll store different amount of textures in it. So in general, here's kind of the CPU-GPU data flow for a rendering engine. So we have our render target, and I will, should have said, I will use a lot of rendering terminology in this talk, so if you're not familiar with it, please afterwards come and talk to me. I'll explain a little bit more in depth. Um, so anyways, we have a CPU and GPU, and we have a memory bus between the two. And on mobile devices, this is a major bottleneck. So we'll push a render target, such as one of our G buffers, or three of them for our case, to the GPU. We write data, then we have to move it back to the CPU. And then we have to bind the render target as a texture to the GPU so we can actually read it, use the material information to do our lighting and shading. This is very expensive on mobile devices, right? Because it's a limited bandwidth between the two. The more data we push back and forth, the less performance we get out of the mobile device. With GMIM enabled, here's what it actually looks like on our mobile devices. We come in and we push our render target to the GPU. Then we write our data, and then we're able to read the data right off the GPU. 
Right, you can't do this on PC or uh, consoles because they don't support this on-chip memory. Right, so by doing that, we save a lot of time. And this is where we get a lot of performance on mobile devices. Right, so here's kind of what our rendering passes look like for GMM. So the first thing we do is we prepare our shadow maps. And then we enable our GPU memory, or GMM is what we call. Uh, in this case, it's for 256. And we bind four render targets, three G buffers, and then our depth stencil target. And at that time, here are all the rendering passes we do without changing textures. We do our pre-Z pass, including linearizing our depth. We write out our G buffer, so we do our general uh, opacity pass, skin, transparency, terrain, decals. We do our deferred decals. We do deferred rain and snow, only if we're 256 enabled. We do our velocity buffers, if we're 128. So out of that, we do I have kind of five boxes. But really, we do a lot of work without having to transfer a lot of data between the CPU and GPU. Once we're done with that, we then switch to binding just two render targets. And then we do our deferred shading and lighting. We do our forward opaque uh, with general and terrain decals. We do our deferred caustics. We do our fog. And this is where our performance magic happens, right? Once we're done, we unbind our render targets for our GMIM passes. And then we do everything else. We have our particles, transparency, water, and pulse effects. So I bring this up because we still have even more optimizations to do in the engine to use uh, this GMIM technology that we have. So here's how it's actually implemented, getting into the dirty details, right? So on OpenGL ES uh, and on iOS, there's this frame buffer fetch extension, or on iOS or Metal, it's called programmable blending. And what this does is well, it supports either 256 bits per uh, pixel or 128 bits per pixel. Uh, on iOS, we default to 256, but if you enable different features, which I'll talk about later, we'll go to 128. Uh, so on Android, like I said, the extension is called Shader Frame Buffer Fetch, and this is what allows us to tag our render targets as in and out textures and be able to read and write to them without transferring them to the CPU. Uh, in our shaders, we actually have specific texture shader sh slots that we use to say, okay, this has to be on the GPU as an in out. And then we have our remote shader compiler actually generate the correct GLSL or metal shader language to make this work. If we're on 256 bit mode, as I mentioned before, we bind our 3G buffer render targets and our depth stencil. And then for shading, we push those out, and then we uh, set up our diffuse and specular textures for accumulation information and do all our shading, right? Not all phones on the Android side support frame buffer fetch, so we also have an implementation for pixel local storage. With pixel local storage, uh, it's mainly ARM GPUs. And we use the extension shader pixel local storage, and it only supports 128 bits. So with this, we don't get all the performance we want uh, just because it doesn't support the amount of memory we need. But we still use it a lot. Uh, inside of our shaders, if you're looking at our HLSL, we actually have a couple constants that our backend shader compiler will actually translate correctly to use the correct storage specifier that the extension requires. And then instead of having the ability to bind our 3G buffers and depth stencil texture, we actually have to push them, pop them, because we don't have enough memory to store all of them. But then when we get to shading, we do store the specular and diffuse light uh, accumulation textures and get our performance boost from that. So you're like, oh, that's great. Awesome, unlimited performance, right? But oh, as always, there's always a catch. So what is the catch? Well, first, not all features work with GMIM enabled. So if you want to have our first shader enabled, or you want to do deferred subsurface scattering, volumetric fog, dif uh, diffuse rain, snow occlusion, those don't work, right? So we're still updating and modifying our render engine to use GMIM, but some of these features actually require pushing their own render targets and popping them off. And once we do that, it actually messes up you know, that on-chip memory that we're using for G buffers or our uh, texture accumulation. Um, lighting accumulation textures. Uh, 
so you have to be careful of that. Some features will actually force GMM to be 128-bit mode instead of 256, even if the device supports it. So if you enable screen space reflections or screen space directional occlusion, motion blur, you can say, yeah, I want 256, but as soon as you enable these features, we force it to be 128. So you could get better quality, but you actually have to sacrifice some performance with that. And it's just because of the way it's implemented in the rendering engine. You know, again, it pushes render targets and pops them, and we just don't have enough memory uh, on the GPU to support everything that we need for these features. Uh, and also, kind of a challenging one is that GMM can be toggled at runtime. So you may be like, oh, for a cutscene, I really want to have reflections, but during gameplay, I want to turn it off. Well, you could do that, but GMM is not going to switch between 256 and 128, right? As we start up the engine, we determine, based on the features you have enabled and what the hardware supports, whether we do 256 or 128. And you can't toggle it during cutscenes or gameplay, right? So that's another catch with using this technology. But it's really cool, right? Because without that technology, we would not be able to show that Bistro scene running on an Android device at 30 frames per second. So I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent and talk about CFG files, config files, and how they are your friends. So this year, what we added is four configuration files for mobile devices, you know, for Android and iOS. They have their own. And we have low, medium, high, and very high. And these configuration files you know, represent you know, the GPU performance capabilities of the Android device itself. So here's an example that I took from our Android low configuration file. So there's a lot of information on here. So the configuration file contains all of our console variables, or CVARs, that enables you to turn on and off different rendering features, tune different rendering features, uh, also tune like uh, simulation features as well. So you can tune your shadow maps, uh, enable shadows or disable them. To, uh, you can turn off uh, fur, turn off water rendering, turn on rendering, whatever you want. So with these configuration files, what you can do is tweak and tune the engine to meet your game's requirements for visual quality based on the power of the Android device, right? Also want to highlight this particular line, this is where we enable GMIM for a low-end device. Uh, setting it to 2 sets it to be uh, used 128-bit uh, data path. Uh, setting it to 1 is actually 256. If you set it to 1 and it runs, great, because you get the most performance out of it. But so here's the interesting thing with, right? So you can say, well, I have a high-end Android device, such as an S9, I could turn on you know, 256 GMIM, but I lose some of the features that reduce my quality. So you can actually, with this configuration system, say, you know what, for high end, I'll set GMIM to be 128, but then I can enable other features, right? I can enable the screen space reflections, enable directional occlusion, other things like that, and get a higher quality visual on the high end devices that support it, and not have to worry so much about the performance because they can handle it. But on the low end devices, you can say, you know what, I can't afford that for my game. Let me turn on some of those, turn off some of those visual quality things, and you know, enable GMIM to be 256 to still get the performance and get a smooth gameplay that users want, without having to sacrifice too much on your quality. Right? Now you may be asking, okay, so you have these low, medium, high, very high. How do I tell what devices use those configuration files? Oh, I actually jump ahead of myself. Um, so you don't have to edit these config files by hand. We actually have inside the editor a dialog box to do all that fun work for you. So here I'm just showing iOS, and you can see for the different things, in this case post-processing, what the low values look like, what the medium, high, very high. So you can get a glance what the different values look like across a range of devices. Now to my next slide. So we have two XML files called AndroidModels.xml and iOS models XML. So in here, you can actually specify, for this given phone model, I want it to use Android Low or Android Medium, right? So we have a default one set up for you based kind of on our own experience of running Lumberyard on a variety of mobile engines or mobile devices. But you could come in and say, for my game, yeah, you know, we're not using a lot of you know, high-end rendering features, so I can actually take a low-end phone, let's say my Note 4, and say, yeah, it's actually a medium, and use the medium config for that. Right, so 
the idea here is to really give you the maximum amount of configuration for your game to run on a wide variety of mobile devices, because that's hard, right? And we want to take some of that hard work off of your plate and put it onto us so that you can focus more on what makes your game interesting, you know, and playing with the balance of what are the features and quality that you can get out of the engine uh, and manage it for the performance side as well. Wow. And one of the cool things is, you may be looking at it, it's like, do I have to list out every individual model number in the XML file? No. We actually support regular expressions. Yay! Make your life just a little bit more easier, right? So here I'm just showing all the models for a Galaxy S5, whether it's European, North America, you know, Africa. Use a regular expression, capture it all, life is better for you. Right. So you're like, what else is there? Well, for my talk, not much. Uh, if you want more information and more technical details, there is a kiosk, uh, 2B, which is on the far side of uh, Amazon's area, where we will show you Bistro running on the PC and running on the mobile devices so you can get a better comparison and contrast. And we can go more into the technical de details of actually what we did. So, but you may also be interested in lighting your scene in minutes, so that's another kiosk not, near, uh, not too far from here. Uh, basically, what it makes to light your scene to get that AAA quality, and it will translate to mobile devices. There are some things you may have to tweak, such as number of lights. Uh, we do not support global illumination at runtime on mobile devices, but there are things you could do to actually create that effect, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that if you, if you are interested. Um, there's another kiosk about talking about how to deploy your game to multiple platforms at once. It'll walk through the mobile workflow, deploying to an Android device through the editor and making changes so you get better live updates through that. And then also you may be interested in how to quickly build animations for your game and seeing how it works on mobile devices. Oh, so thank you for coming. Again, if you have more questions or want to get more technical details, I will be here, I'll be actually at the kiosk uh, showing uh, the bistro scene. So feel free to come up, talk to me, and I'll be happy to explain more of what we did and how we got it done. Thank you.